हेलो डियर स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज डॉक्टर अद्वैत एंड वेलकम टू द वेरी फर्स्ट लेक्चर ऑफ इलेवेंथ स्टैंडर्ड बायोलॉजी एज मोस्ट ऑफ यू ऑलरेडी नो बायोलॉजी इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट सब्जेक्ट्स एज फार एज द नीट एग्जामिनेशन इज कंसर्न नीट इज द नेशनल एलिजिबिलिटी कम एंट्रेंस टेस्ट it is the single most important examination for entry into the medical courses it is conducted at an all india level and there is a total of 180 questions that are asked in this exam for four marks each leading to a grand total of 720 marks the neat examination is based on three subjects physics chemistry and biology 90 questions out of the 180 questions are from biology 90 questions that means 360 marks out of 720 50% weightage of the entire neat examination is based on biology so i think it should be very obvious now that your success in the neat examination completely depends upon your knowledge and understanding of biology biology for neat is basically going to comprise of 38 chapters these 38 chapters are from the ncert textbooks for 11th and 12th standard the 11th standard ncert textbook contains 22 chapters and the 12th standard ncert contains 16 chapters that brings us to a total of 38 chapters almost all the 90 questions that are asked in the neat examination are from these two books your success in neat examination is going to depend upon your understanding and recall of these chapters but and it's a big but as you can see it is extremely difficult to remember everything from these two books and 38 chapters unless you have understood each and every concept each and every page precisely and clearly that would require an extremely strong foundation on which you can build your knowledge and that dear students is the entire philosophy behind my coaching for the next 2 years we are not going to focus on any kind of rote learning but all our efforts are going to be directed towards understanding and concept clarity because once you've understood something once your concepts are clear remembering and recall simply becomes second nature it becomes a mere triviality you don't even have to think about it so my only expectation from you dear students is this do not miss a single lecture every lecture is going to build upon the previous lecture and will improve your understanding of biology so as much as possible do not miss a single lecture and secondly be prepared to work hard if you are willing to do these two things i can assure you that success is guaranteed so with all of this out of the way let's start building a strong foundation right from today with our very first lecture which is going to be introduction to biology now the very first thing that i want to talk about is you may have heard these absurd and weird words whenever you must have studied biology before to give you a few examples words like uvula hypothalamus frenulum anemophilus microphylus medulla oblongata these are words which you must have heard previously and at some point in your earlier studies this thought must have come to your mind ke re bhai ye sab soch kon raha hai ye sab ut patang shabd aa kahan se rahe hain so if you have thought this in the past i just want to discuss a few things about the origin of these words so my first question to you is how old do you think 
is the English language. The language in which we are conversing right now. How old do you think it is? I'm going to pause for 5 seconds so that you can come up with a number in your mind. 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, 1000 years, 2000 years, 5000 years. I just want you to think of how old do you think is the English language? So I can't predict what is the number that you just came up with. But I'm sure you'd be shocked by this. The English that we converse in today is called as the late modern English. And it is only about 300 years old. Only about 200 to 300 years old. What this basically means is that the language in which we are speaking today did not even exist in this form 300 years back. Hardly 200, 300 years old. So what were people speaking before this time? So before this, about 500, 600 years ago, people were speaking in early modern English and that is what Shakespeare used. So majority of you who are from ICSC, I think you have Merchants of Venice in your syllabus. So if you've studied that, you must have heard these words like the, thou and all these words had a very different grammar to what we speak today. So this was called as the early modern English, what Shakespeare used and it is about 400 to 500 years old. Even before that, there was a form called as Old English, which is about a thousand years old. And if you were to go even before that, I'm talking 2000, 3000 years ago, English is derived from a group of languages which was called Germanic or Anglo-Saxon. So over a period of time, as people started moving, as people went from different areas to different areas, they brought along their languages which influenced other languages. So over a period of time, Anglo-Saxon evolved into Old English, Old English evolved into Early English, Early English evolved into the late modern English that we use today. This was the language of the local people, or should I say peasants, which were living in Europe. So in most of the European areas, especially in the United Kingdom, this is the language that the peasants were using. Now, this was the first thing I wanted you to understand today, that what has been the history of the English language. The second thing I wanted to talk about today was this photo. Any of you know what this picture is about? Now, this is the Gutenberg's press. This is the first modern printing press. It was originally invented by a person called as Gutenberg and hence the name Gutenberg's press. The first modern printing press for books. This was invented in 1436. 1436. So what were people doing before 1436? Were there books in existence before 1436? I'm going to pause again for 5 seconds so that you can think about this. Were there books present before 1436? Now, majority of you, if you are really thinking about this, would have concluded that Are Mahabharat to definitely likha gaya tha 2000 saal pehle. Even the Bible was written 2000 years back, which means there had to be books before 1436. So if the printing press was invented in 1436, how were books present before that time? The answer to that is, all these books were handwritten. Once the book was handwritten, and if you wanted copies of the book, then there were people called as scribes. There were people called as scribes. They used to sit in this big room which was called as the scriptorium and they used to diligently copy down every book so you can see this scribe has a book here and he's literally copying down the contents of the book similarly there's a person here there's a person here and this is how copies of books were made before 1436 it was an extremely tedious process and because of this as you can clearly now understand books were extremely expensive because it would take one or two years just to copy one book to another book, just to make one copy of the book. 
so books were extremely expensive and were mostly maintained only by the rich people or the monarchy or the royalty the kings and the queens they were the only people who had ownership of books at that time so if you understood this concept now that what was happening before 1436 it should be clear to you that copying a book down was a big deal and you could not copy it in any language because if you wanted to sell a book or if you wanted to send a book to another country to another kingdom the people there or the learned people there should understand the book so at this time from around 500 to 1000 AD when all these from 500 to about 1600 AD when all these books were being handwritten it was important that there was a language in which you would write these books which would be common across Europe or common across most of the countries in that region where all this was happening and this brings us to an extremely important point which is the Latin language the language of the Roman Catholic Church the official language of the Roman Catholic Church so Latin was a language that was adopted by the Roman Church and the significance is that the Roman Catholic Church was one of the only educational institutes during the time from around 500 AD to 1600 AD so everyone who knew anything about natural philosophy or science had to learn Latin so you may be home and you may be speaking in old English or you may be speaking in a dialect of the Anglo-Saxon language but once you were going to go to work all work was going to be done in the Latin language because that was a language which was common across all the scholarly people and all the people who were in the Catholic Church all the royalty so these people knew Latin which was used to communicate and when they were talking to their you know family or were talking to the peasants or the peasants were talking amongst themselves they would be using some other language so Latin was the language of science in addition the Catholic Church also preserved a lot of information from Arabia from other parts of the world and they were accumulating all of this and when they were accumulating this and making books out of it those were also going to be in Latin and the other prevalent thing was that Christianity was spreading across Europe so there were a lot of churches and all of them had now made a huge network for people to communicate so if you wanted to communicate from one region to another the best option you had was the Latin language so even if you were a peasant and you did not know Latin you would at least know a priest who knew Latin so the last part is important here that the ordinary people did not know about Latin but they had access to somebody who knew Latin now the reason why we are talking about all of this which might seem very random to you is to understand this point that English as a language evolved from Old English to Early English to Late Modern English so that is how the English language was evolving at the same time this was the language of the peasants the language that the ordinary common people used to communicate day to day but there was a separate language which was common across many countries which was being used by the Roman Catholic Church to record all scientific things and that language was Latin so most of the scientific words are from the Latin language and slowly and slowly as we started using English more and more we dropped the Latin language but the important words or the important concepts or the important things which were written in those books in Latin language with Latin words continued to infuse our English language and that is why you will notice that when you study biology there are a lot of words which are going to be of Latin origin and not only biology even in physics even in chemistry in many sciences you will come across words which are derived from Latin the reason why it was important to talk about this at the very beginning is because as we continue learning biology you will hear or you will learn a lot of words which you will find weird and which have their origin in this 
old scientific language which nobody uses today which is latin so there are other chapters where this is going to become very essential so right at the beginning i wanted to clarify this that why do you have weird words in biology in fact biology the word biology the science that i'm trying to teach you comes from two latin words which are bios and logos bios means life and logos means study of so biology means study of life so the science that i am going to be teaching you for the next 2 years is the study of life biology as i said biology is the study of living organisms and all living organisms without exception are going to do work now what do i mean by they are going to do work so right now i'm speaking to you i am moving my hands my heart is beating my lungs are taking in air are expelling carbon dioxide all these things which i am doing right now as a living organism is work physics force into displacement so all living things are going to do work of some sort and to do work you require energy so again i want to take a 5 second pause here so that you can think about a few forms of energy so think what are the forms of energy that you know of okay i think many of you must have thought about kinetic energy potential energy electrical energy nuclear energy light energy heat energy wind energy geothermal energy so you may have thought of one or two or maybe even all of these which are sources of energy which one of these do you think living organisms use to do work do you think we use light energy do we go out in the morning stand in the sunlight and get energized to do work do you think we use electrical energy mobile ki tarah hum log bhi charging karte hain so if i was to ask you what is the energy that living organisms use what do you think is that if any of you said atp then you are 100% correct all living things with very few exceptions use atp adenosine triphosphate as the chemical energy to help them do their work or their daily activity so all living things do work and to do work they require energy and the form of energy that we living things use is going to be atp so that brings us to the question how do we get atp i mean how did i get the atp for my heart to beat and the answer to that is through the food we eat so most of the food that we eat can be broken down into glucose and when you combine glucose with oxygen you get carbon dioxide water and atp this is a reaction which you have definitely done in school and it is called as respiration so almost all living things almost 99% of all living organisms are going to do this form of chemical reaction which generates atp this is called as respiration keep this in mind so 99% of living things are going to do respiration by which they break down glucose to produce atp so i get glucose from the food but how is glucose produced in nature so i am not producing glucose i am getting it from the food i eat but in nature how is glucose produced so you know the answer to this as well that there are certain organisms which can make glucose by taking carbon dioxide and water and combining them together of course you know from third or fourth standard that these are the green plants which use sunlight and the chlorophyll present in their cells to make glucose along with glucose oxygen is the by product so you are aware of this as well this reaction is called as photosynthesis so the upper reaction is respiration and the lower reaction is photosynthesis all living organisms will do respiration but only those living organisms with chlorophyll plants will be able to do photosynthesis so i hope this is clear these two main biological reactions and depending on that we can classify living organisms 
into two groups you will have those which prepare their food and those which do not prepare their own food so what does this mean this does not mean ke kya tum lunch breakfast dinner banata hai kya tumko pav bhaji that does not that is not what we are trying to say here when i say prepare your own food or do not prepare your own food what i mean is that as an organism can you produce glucose or you can't so if you have chlorophyll you can use sunlight and you can produce glucose if you don't have chlorophyll you will not be able to do that so based on that living organisms can be classified as those which can prepare their own food and those which cannot prepare their own food which brings us to three more latin words so we have seen bios which means life and logos which means study of now we have three more words you have auto which means self you have hetero which means different and you have trophos which means to eat auto hetero trophos self different to eat so if i say autotroph what does that mean self to eat it does not mean to eat self what it means is to eat what is prepared by self so in the case of plants they will take carbon dioxide and water and they will produce glucose so they have made glucose and then they will take this glucose and they will make atp they will take this glucose and they will do this respiration reaction and they will make atp so plants made glucose and then they use that glucose to make atp so khana khud ne banaya aur fir wohi khana kha ke atp banaya as far as we are concerned animals we do not have chlorophyll so we cannot do this reaction which is called as photosynthesis but we still need glucose we still need glucose because otherwise we will not get atp so we get glucose from plants we basically eat plants or eat something which eats plants to get that glucose so autotroph are organisms which eat food which has been prepared by themselves and heterotrophs hetero meaning different trophos meaning to eat to eat different nahi heterotroph basically means to eat what is prepared by different prepared by somebody else so you have autotroph and you have heterotroph autotrophs like green plants do not need to move from one place to another so if i am a tree standing in a meadow as you can see in the picture my roots are going to go deep into the soil and are going to absorb water i am going to be standing in sunlight almost 12 hours a day the air around me is going to have sufficient amount of carbon dioxide i can use all of this and the chlorophyll in my leaves to make glucose standing right here and this glucose i can give to all the cells in my body so that they can do respiration and make atp and can go about with their life so this plant does not need to go anywhere it can just stand here and make glucose and use that glucose to make atp so those organisms which prepare their own food are called autotrophs and they do not move about and they are called as plants the other side of the coin is those which do not prepare their own food which as we saw are called heterotrophs now heterotrophs like this lion here has to move from one place to another now there is no choice the lion cannot stand at one place because if the lion stands at one place after some time the glucose in his body will be used up to make atp if he needs more glucose he cannot just stand here and get it he will have to run after a zebra he will have to catch a zebra and eat it so that zebra had eaten grass and he had got the zebra had got the glucose from the grass and the lion ate the zebra and got it indirectly through the zebra so if this lion does not move this lion is not going to get any kind of energy and it will simply die so for him there is no choice he cannot stand at one place he has to move from one place to another such organisms which do not prepare their own food called as heterotrophs have to move from one place to another are called as animals so you have plants and you have animals the latin word for plant is botan and the latin word for animals is zoon zoon does that ring a bell you know since you were 5 years old that the place where they keep animals is called as the zoo the reason why it is called as a zoo is because it is full of zoon animals 
so study of plants is called botany and study of animals is called zoology so study of living organisms biology is broadly classified into these two groups botany and zoology so i hope this basic understanding of biology is clear with everybody now and we are on the same page as far as this is concerned okay with all of this out of the way we are now going to start with the actual chapter which is cell i know that most of you all of you have done cell at some point in school so i am now going to ask you what is the definition of cell and i am going to give you 5 seconds to just think about this and come up with the definition in your mind all right majority of you would have said cell is defined as the structural and functional unit of life which you must have read out when you were doing your schooling everybody says the same thing for the last 15 years whenever i have asked this question i have always got the same answer cell is a structural and functional unit of life now if you see this definition the most important term in the definition is the word unit because i can simply say cell is the unit of life and that still completes my definition so now my question to you is what is the meaning of the word unit what do you think the word unit means i want you to think about this as we move on to the next part of today's lecture but i want you to keep this question in your mind that what is the meaning of the word unit all of you have been saying this definition for the last 2 3 years but i am positive that majority of you are not clear about what is the meaning of this word so last do teen saal se everybody must be saying cell is a structural and functional unit of life unit of life unit of life but now when it comes to the actual meaning i want to see how many of you actually know what this means okay so before i tell you what unit means please answer this question is cell the smallest particle in your body it's a simple yes or no question is cell the simplest particle in your body so some of you may have said yes cell is the smallest particle in my body some of you may have said no to all those who said cell is the smallest particle in my body i want you guys to see this picture this as you all must have seen previously is a picture of a cell and i think the minute you see this it should be clear that cell is not the smallest thing in your body because the minute you see this cell sabse chota thodi hai this is the nucleus which is inside the cell which is smaller than the cell so is cell the smallest thing in your body no it is the nucleus acha is nucleus the smallest thing in your body no because you know that it is made up of dna and rna so nucleus sabse chota nahi hai dna sabse chota hai but then you will say no but dna is going to be made up of proteins so dna nahi protein sabse chota hai but then you know ki proteins are made up of carbon hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen so protein sabse chota nahi hai carbon sabse chota hai but then you know that carbon atom is made up of protons neutrons and electrons so sabse chota carbon nahi carbon ka proton hai in 11th and 12th standard physics you will learn ki protons can also be broken down into smaller particles so when i asked you this question is cell the smallest thing in your body the answer is definitely no remember that cell is not the smallest thing in your body there are many other things which are smaller than the cell which are present in your body keep this in mind we will come back to this in 2 minutes so that brings me again to the question that what is unit which i asked you about 5 minutes back what is the meaning of the word unit now in the english language the word unit has three basic meanings number one something with which we measure so you know grams kilograms centimeters meters kilometers all of these are things jisse hum log kuch na kuch measure karte hain which is going to be called as a unit 
let's put this in the definition of cell and see whether it fits cell is the structural and functional something with which we measure of life so i think it is obvious ke ye wo definition nahi hai jo cell ke definition mein baithta hai the second definition of the word unit is one or singular so if you were to buy a mobile today or if you were to buy any electronic item on the box it will say this package contains camera one unit or cell phone one unit charger one unit cables two units so what that basically means is ke box ke andar there is one camera or one phone there is going to be one charger there are going to be two cables so the word units is for the individual single pieces let's put this in our definition of cell cell is the structural and functional one or singular of life as you can see even the second meaning of the word unit does not fit in the definition of cell so that brings us to the third and final definition or final meaning of the word unit and that is smallest piece showing property smallest piece or particle showing property so let me explain this to you with an example if you were to take a slab or a brick of iron and you were to make it into something smaller you will get iron filings if you were to take these iron filings and you were to break them even more you will get atoms of iron and if you were to take these atoms of iron and you were to remove a single piece out of it you will have an electron so on the screen you can see that there is going to be a brick of iron iron filings atom of iron and electron of iron so iron brick ka small pieces uska small pieces and uska bhi small pieces till we now cannot further divide this now all of you know that iron is attracted to magnets or a magnetic field can affect iron that is the fundamental property of iron so if i was to bring a magnet close to the iron brick do you think it will get attracted yes if i was to bring a magnet close to the iron filings do you think it would get attracted yes if i was to bring a magnet close to the atom the iron atom do you think it will affect the atom yes but if i was to bring the magnet close to a single electron do you think that will get affected no so the brick of iron shows properties of iron the iron filings show properties of iron even the atom the atom of the iron element is going to show the property of iron however an electron of that atom does not show that property so what is the smallest thing in the brick of iron the electron but what is the smallest thing showing property of iron that dear students is the atom and this is again something that you must have learned in 7th or 8th standard science the unit of a element is atom the unit of the element is atom chote se choti cheez jo element ki property batati hai wo hai atom kya usse choti cheeze hain hain but kya wo property batati hai nahi and that is why they are not called units so i hope this word unit the third meaning is clear to you smallest particle showing property let's use that in our definition of the cell cell we said is the structural and functional unit of life let's replace unit with our third definition cell is defined as the structural and functional smallest particle showing property of life and this is why i asked you is cell the smallest thing in a living organism is cell the smallest thing in my body the answer to that is no cell is not the smallest thing in my body but is cell the smallest living thing in my body then the answer is yes 
living things can make copies of themselves living things have reactions going on inside them living things can repair themselves can a cell do all of these things which are property of life yes can the atom of iron or the atom of carbon inside my cell do this no a carbon atom simply cannot make a copy of itself so carbon does not show any property of life however the cell is going to show properties of life so once again is cell the smallest thing in my body no but is cell the smallest living thing in my body yes and that is why cell is the structural and functional unit of life i wanted to discuss all of this with you today because in your school a lot of these things have just been told to you and you have mugged them up like a little parrot if you want to succeed in 11th and 12th biology if you want to succeed in the neat examination little nitty gritties like this like how we just saw what is the meaning of the word unit which is going to come at multiple places in bio will now be clear to you so i want all of you to understand that the first few lectures that we are going to do is going to be building a strong foundation on which i can build upon do not miss any of the future lectures because this is what is going to happen in the first few lectures we are going to see a lot of things you thought that you knew but did not like unit okay let's have a quick recap so today we saw what are latin words like bios which means life logos which means study of auto which means self hetero which means different trophos which means to eat botan which means plant and zoon which means animals we also saw what is the definition of biology biology is the study of life or the study of living organisms we saw what is a reaction called as respiration done by almost all living things and what is photosynthesis which is not done by all living things based on that we categorize living things as mostly autotroph or heterotroph plant and animal plants are called botan and the study of plants is called botany animals are called zoon and the study of animals is called zoology and the last thing that we saw is what is a cell a cell is a structural and functional unit of life and i hope that the word unit now is clear to everybody this dear students concludes today's lecture i hope you understood everything and i cannot wait to see your smiling faces even in the next lecture good day and god bless